Hello? Howdy. Hi, how are you? Well, uh, better. I am much better today. Good. <laughs> Good morning and... Oh, no, no. I thought someone else joined. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't how are know. you? All right. Are uh, Google Summer Code folks going to join today, or is that... I didn't quite understand. I think Rishali was like, uh, she wanted to present something today and not yesterday. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think she's going to present today, but I don't see her yet, so... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you might... If you could ping her and remind her. <laughs> I don't know if she still wants to do it, but... Because we did it, like, yesterday we did our meeting, and we did, uh, I went over her slides for her presentation, so. It'd be nice to see it, though. It's very, very good. It's got some very good stuff in it. Yeah, Raj just posted in the chat that he won't be able to make it today. I don't know if he's do a general reply. Okay. Good. Well, Amanda, Morgan. Good morning. How are you guys? Okay. Um, I'm multitasking, so I'll be in and out. Okay. Uh, so we have our the Notion page, which should be available on the Slack. Yeah, I'll put it here too. <clears throat> uh, I had a a. A fortune of someone delivering me some Starbucks before today's meeting, so I'll be particularly awake at <laughs> this meeting. At least I feel like I kind of maybe drank this thing that had like espresso shots in it a little too fast, so oh, like, yeah. I'm on the verge of being slightly wired. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that'll be probably good for positive side. Is I'm awake and able to function. Negative side, I'm going to try to contain my rambling. So we'll oh, yeah. <laughs> Caffeinated <laughs> rambling, I guess. And yeah, like for Amanda, I'm, that's okay. I have to, yeah, do that too. Um, yeah, the notion's ready to go. There's only a few things. I don't know. I, I'm, I want to do like general updates and stuff, but I don't, I don't have a, a lot um, of like new stuff to add this week myself. So I don't know if we want to um, do like general updates. Everyone's here. I'm not yeah. sure Charlie will be joining us or not yet. Okay. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do the general updates? <clears throat> I'll go last. Okay. I know that you've been doing a lot of stuff. Um, I saw you. I saw you preview the the bond sustainability talk. Thank okay. you for doing all that. Um, I, uh, I'll say more when it's my turn, but, um, I wouldn't have been able to do anything this week. Uh, something came up for me, so, yeah. yeah. But th thank you for doing that. It looks good. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah, uh, Amanda, if you want to go, or Morgan. Jesse, if you want to give your update, or if that was okay. your update. Okay, I'm going to, I'll briefly share my screen, too, just to kind of give right. people the notion and stuff. <clears throat> uh, yeah, here we go. So, um, I, this, I think this is pretty accurate. I think it's the 22nd time. I know it's sort of basically the same as Diva Worms. Like, we're like the 22nd meeting of this year for yeah. this one. Yeah, pretty much on the same schedule. Um... Um, my updates are, uh, I'm going to go through these later, but, but I'm going to come up more in depth a little bit later on the condition future stuff, the reading, the, um, you know, Norbert Weiner book reading group, Google Summer Code, Bond Sustainable AI, those are all things that kind of, 
I don't know where there's been like movement on those fronts. Um, I was thinking there should be a different number, but that's okay. Yeah, that was, that was last week's. Um, <clears throat> but for me, um, it's so funny because <laughs> as, as people may recall, uh, Wednesday night, I basically had uh, like low key food poison or something like that. Oh. We still did the the reading group, which was great, and I'm really happy. I continue to be really um, appreciative of everything that's happening in, in that group. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later. Um, but then I had a massive like combination of. All these things, like, like kind of like a family health situation. And it was this between kind of like the end of that meeting and basically today, I've been just totally like blitzed and kind of out of sorts and a little bit uneasy. Uh, so it's been one of those. I'm really thankful that Bradley could totally spearhead the sponsor sustainable AI stuff because that's some important thing and good for the lab and good for work we've done. But like I was I was gonna be totally not helpful in that. Um uh so I, I really appreciate um you doing that and I, I don't want to just seem like I kind of avoided that. I was actually heavily under like duress basically. Um but I'm great like I feel much much better now. I think I think things are in the clear. Uh but it was, it was a tough week, um, to be very honest. So, or at least half a week. It's funny because it it, it was such a weird, like, pocket dimension of space. Um, but things are good now, uh, on the whole. I'm looking forward to Memorial Day weekend stuff. I am also looking forward to kind of, as we get into a lot of kind of stuff on the docket right now, we have, it almost, like, stuck up on us, but... As I, as I, I'll just start, I guess I'll start blending into these other things, but, um, the blue mentioned bond sustainable AI, uh, I think B can be removed here though. Um, are we still doing something with that or is that old now? Uh, well, the paper is still being updated, but yeah, this is an accepted, the paper, I mean, it's due like in July, so. Okay. okay. So that's, that's done, still yeah. happening. Okay. Yeah. Um, hyper digital designs at the very end of last week's meeting, I think, or just after it, um, <clears throat> we were accepted to that. Um, and that's, this is basically um, a modified frontier map presentation on my part. I don't know if I put much in here. Um, not yet, but um, it's it's essentially uh, it's hyper digital designs is. I show this easily. Uh, it's it's essentially a conference that um, Jenny from Plot Twisters and a cohort. Actually, I don't know if I've explained this. It's actually um, it's a. Uh, I don't have the, the, the actual website here. Um, maybe this? Yeah, it should be. Yeah. So this group, How to Play with Fire, um, I always appreciate Jenny because Jenny does a great... Jenny, like, when I one of my first websites, long, long before Log in the Lab entered my life, and then when I was a, a younger person, I, I had, like, a website that was like uh in in like a specific language like delta change change and fire and so jay and i had this sort of overlap of our uh ways of phrasing things yeah which i was i really appreciate because we, we had no like prior connection um but basically what this is is um this hyper digital design workshop is at Cambridge and uh, I think there's some relation to Oxford, but it doesn't, it doesn't say it here. There's a website somewhere, but but these are basically people that Jenny met through the Dizzy, 
at the, the Diverse Intelligence Summer Institute, um, albeit uh, she was in the storyteller track of that. And so she met a lot of the people here, um, Ryan and Brandon, and I think Olivia also uh, from that event. Oops. So it led to this collaborative workshop they wanted to do following up from that. And it's, it's a little bit more narrative based um, and, and kind of philosophy based, but it's a really great avenue for me to kind of flesh out the Frontier Map paper. So I want to try to do that as much as possible. I don't think I'm going to get a full thing, but maybe a, a decent preprint by that time. Um, that's on the docket. That's an exciting thing. Um, yeah. Um, FQXI, I mean, I don't, I submitted something to this. It's not really a final version. I want to finish that out, um, but I probably should be off the thing. The the only two real big things in terms of like this, blending a bit from my updates into this, this week. Um, this week and I'm finalizing the um, submissions for We Robot, which are actually due the first. Um, so there'll be one, at least, I think at least two, one plot to which is one, um, I should say this, like, uh, uh, I think that one's going to be like the, basically we have, basically there's sort of following up from last year. There's, there's sort of the, there's one there's one from last year that was basically going to be um, this this one from last year was was kind of a, a really interesting uh, it stemmed from even from I guess notes from when we had notes in Chicago about this actually oh yeah um, uh, so it, it was it was a long weaving process there and is doing an updated version of where plot is now. Um, and the other one is basically um, yeah this one will be a little bit more um, that that related and we may Potentially, I have to talk to Jen about this, actually. Um, that one. Uh, I, I'm, 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 least, I'm least sure about that one. Um, and that there's sort of something to be said about this in, in general, um, which is Jenna and I are kind of talking about what we want to do with that and also like evaluating summer plans in general because we're kind of at a, a decision point of do we want to push this forward or we're going to let this kind of ride for a little bit and come back to it later. Uh, we don't we don't really know yet. Um, I might have a, I might try to have a meeting like a more formal like society ethics tech meeting soon ish about that. But it's 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 kind of in that state right now. Um, but that's what's going on with with we robot and and these two are like definite yeses this is a, a maybe um and tier map i've kind of talked about and then um this one here i don't know i think yeah i think this is all stuff that amanda added or something like that um but the india Hippolito related conference about what are we calling it First annual web conference of the International Society for the Philosophy of the Sciences of the Mind, um, or ISPSM. Um, just to show this here again, um, the deadline's been extended for two weeks, which is pretty cool. There's also best meme prize, which I think we should like. I think I think I think we should like legitimately consider this um, because we have main power here and uh, we can do it. So we'll think about that. I think I think there's some really good stuff about representations we could we could do or like 
things kind of related to not just a meme, but like I think we could incorporate some really cool concepts into that too. I'm actually going to copy this because I haven't okay. put this in here. Um, not obviously a big deal, but uh, just to put this here. Um, I know Amanda's kind of been fleshing that out, which is great. Um, I want to do something else for this, and I forget where I put it in the Notion space, but that's going to have other things. So maybe we have one to two submissions. I know they also had, um, let's not let me do this here. Uh, there was also, we had, we had a little discussion previously about are we going to do a symposia or a whatever. If I feel really confident, I might swing for the fences with a symposia too, but I don't, that doesn't seem like it. So I think just one or two papers is going to be great. And of yeah. course, our, our main stuff. Um, cool. So that's kind of the docket for uh, all this stuff. Oh, did, I don't know if I really said, <clears throat> did I say about the Neuralimina stuff? I think I did last time. Last time, yeah. Um, that was, that was good. I'm going to, um, this can be kind of like done now and off the thing, but, um, that was a really good thing. I, I met the BCI guys, folks who, who one of them works like in a neurotech and implant space. I met a couple people at the, the cognitive, um, fluid interfaces lab at MIT, which is someplace I'm considering like, applying to in the future. Uh, I know Jenny also wants to do stuff in, in the media lab at some point. So there's there's a lot of um, fun stuff in that space going on. Um, also, Amanda, I need to send you some stuff soon. And I, I think I asked, I don't know, I was going to ask like, about that elsewhere, but um, more about that later, just as a reminder. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's pretty much... That's pretty much it. Um, this is just the general like task. But was there anything? Is there anything else? There were a few things that kind of crept up recently, and I don't know if I put them in. Um, in like, where's the uh, call for involvement spaces? Uh, there's our extension notice. Oh, uh, Hussein posted this. I think this would be a good thing to try to. Well, I mean, not in two days, but yeah. Um, the hard problem stuff. Uh, okay, I was I did think about that, but I kind of this week kind of blew up for me as I mentioned. So, but there's yeah. hyperdigital designs. Um, these models of consciousness things. Um, I don't think we have anything to submit to this one, right? Uh, what like is complex it? system. Oh, probably not. No. Uh, it looks really cool, yeah. um, but I don't think we have anything easy to like. Nothing really there right now, um, and I think this one's same too. It looks very cool, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else on like the upcoming submissions things list? Just to kind of keep that uh, flow. On, on 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 our radar. <clears throat> yeah, I don't really know of anything right now. Yeah. What's well, because in the summer in the, in 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 the later half of the year, um, there will be events like We Robot, and also uh, the ISP the Society of Mind, Society for Philosophy of Science of Mind. Yeah. I S. I'm gonna just put this here so I can do that. I S P S M. I S P S M and We Robot um, are all gonna be very end of the year stuff. This will this will be happening soon. This is actually in a few days. Okay. Um, the bottom yeah. end. end of the year. Uh, later on, um, and this is June, I think, but, but I think there's going to be like, eventually there's neuromatch. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mention that. Um, I oh, should yeah, probably neuromatch. mention 
Neuromatch. Um, like, uh, I don't know if anyone in the lab applied to it, or I don't know if you're being a mentor this year or not, Bradley, but... Um, well, I but, yeah, uh, I applied to be a faculty mentor, and then I don't think anyone's doing Neuromatch in the group, so... Uh, it's, you know, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> we'll definitely, well, like I said last week, we'll try to do like a maybe a select pod or a slow pod or whatever. Um, are you are you mentoring computational neuroscience or the other ones? Uh, uh, well, I said I, you know, I could do maybe something in either one. I don't know uh, what okay. they'll assign me, but uh, usually it's computational neuroscience. So. Well, there's at least one person in the lab who's been invited to participate, and that's, that's me. So I may do the deep learning course this summer. Invited um, to do what? <laughs> uh, I, I was accepted at the deep learning course. So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, great. I, I, I'm really not sure yet if I'm going to do it, and I have like a week to decide because there's a lot of I'm trying to think what's the best thing for me to do ahead of like the grad school stuff I'm going to start. Right. And I don't, I don't entirely know yet. Um, it's, it's on the table. Um, and I'm, I'm happy about that. I, 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 I was accepted, I think, to do it last year, but I had to, I, I declined participating because it's, I had other things to do. Um, but it's, you know, it's always a good time, even if it's a little crazy time, but it's a good thing to do. Yeah. So I think I think that's it for like um, events. I feel like there's a few that I and I don't think they're in I don't think there's anything else in this in this space that we've mentioned, but I feel like there's a few other things. Um, maybe this might be too late for these if they get Oh, the triple AI. The embodied intelligence one, I think, is is due like later this month or something like that. Oh. Um, oh, they're due at the end of June. Um, so maybe. Um, I'll put this. I'll put this in 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 there. Um, just, just to kind of mention it. I don't, I don't yeah. know what's gonna fit for this, but we'll, we'll see. Oops. This was June thirtieth. Super. Uh, just because there's a lot of things we could try to like, even, even to an extent, I don't know. We'll see. This is not. I don't think it's the highest priority. I don't think it's like a, a good chance of it. But just right. to kind of. What are there. those like uh, talks or, like, what is the, okay, submissions. Short pages. Uh, short short pages. papers. Okay. Uh, I think would be the most tenable for what we have. Um, I'm also like. This is for the embodied one, and I think the embodied one's the later, the later, like the later deadline. Yeah. But I mean, topics are embodied intelligence, representation, computational issues, graphs, visual attention. Uh, what's what information is important for HRI, inspired by human human interactions? This feels like very. There's something. If you, we don't. I don't think we need to push anything here, but we probably we could. Um, and then there's also like, I don't know, I think, I think there's a lot of things here. Um, I'm kind of focusing on the, the embodiment one, but like, uh, not fintech, but there's things, the metaverse one. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this one's already passed. So this one's already kind of done. Um, oh yeah. I don't know if we asked for an extension or something, but I, I think 
So I was, I was curious because it could have fit with some things for AI metaverse stuff, especially some like maybe the Google Summer Code thing. But for right now, um, I think it's just this one's still available, the uh, embodied one, because that's still a good month for that. So yeah. we'll, we'll think about it. Um, yeah. We'll so it, it would be nice to see the uh, AI Tim's metaverse one. What, it, what kinds of topics are they covering in that? Oh, um, like what? What suggested things? Yeah, like what are the things that they suggest, or yeah, they would suggest topics. Is that uh, way here? Yeah, uh. Synthetic data for computer vision, 3D scanning technologies and reconstruction approaches, future communication tech, synthetic data for AI. They seem to have this love of synthetic data, which is interesting because... Uh, we've talked about this. Uh, uh, oh. Sorry, I'm just going to copy this here. Right. I'll go back up there. Oh, I was being a little weird here. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I, I was curious about that too. Yeah. Digital twins and simulation robotics, AI powered technologies. Yeah, so that looks interesting. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to get a sense of what people were interested in in that area. And we'll talk about digital <laughs> twins in a bit, but uh, later on. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Scientific visualization. I don't know if I can attend it or not. Um, or if we could submit something else, but I think it would definitely be an interesting event to look at what they're doing, yeah. what they're doing there. So. Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Right. Um, okay, I think that's like my general tour of stuff. Um, the next, the only thing I would go about next is like these actual individual meetings to get talk to them briefly. But I don't know what um, what you want to do next, or are you feeling? About uh, you want to do more? that like after we do our th our other stuff that we're going to do, or I mean, we can come back to that actually. Um. It, it, if I, I don't know what else is on the docket, um, this, these won't take long to do, so I could just okay it briefly. Or... Well, yeah, why don't we just do it briefly then? Okay. Um, so this week at the reading group, we covered. Um, we, we fleshed out a little more uh, certain project management stuff. Um, we we went over the gestures of awareness doc. A reflection note, which is really good, kind of consolidating some of the ideas there. Uh, and we've talked a bit about gestures awareness, but also we, we took a deep dive, deeper dive into, um, well, we mentioned a lot of like, uh, I guess, India's related things. Um, and then we took, I, mean, I am very curious about the ethics of phenomenology thing. That's something that's definitely in my mind for the future, because I feel like that's there's there's something about the space of subjective personal experience and pushing on a lot of important paradigms i think so more about that ahead for sure it kind of related to um some of the disability and, and neurodivergent stuff um this is a very interesting discussion we've had there and then we basically took a deep dive into Evan Thompson's work. Um, I think the original title is like Life as Something. Um, but then from auto, basically kind of Evan Thompson giving us an update on Varela. And we had a lot of nice discussions about um, about that. So that quickly, that, that was basically what we covered in, in that meeting. Um, I really enjoyed that. I don't know if Amanda still here wants to say anything about the humanities of human beings, but we had, we got the chapter two on that um, today or a lot this week. Progress and entropy, a lot of interesting discussions there. Um, I am back and I would like to add something because I found a paper hmm. from Levin and Chris Fields, whose name I recognized. Um, mm -hmm. And I shared it in the Slack, but so one of the things that came up uh, on Thursday was why should we see life or or these local enclaves of 
decreasing entropy, so life, but also machines maybe, why should we see those as anomalous when, as Weiner has said a few times, that kind of organization comes cheap, like from disordered energy, um, kind of like von mm. Forrester's, maybe exactly von Forrester's order from noise idea, um, where you can get order from disorder as long as there is energy, and you obviously have to hash out what, what that means. Um, but I was getting the impression that like if this energy you know, comes kind of cheap and it can be disordered, um, then why is self-organization an, like anomalous? Because that's also been the way when I started talking about it is he keeps saying like local enclaves amidst a, mm -hmm. a system whose order is decreasing. Um, so this Levin and Fields paper, let me find the exact line. Um, it was in the bioevolution channel. Yeah. Um, and the line was something like, here's why life could be seen as thermodynamically preferable, something like that. Uh, and so I haven't read the paper yet, but that could be really interesting. Um, we suggest on this basis that life is, um, is thermodynamically preferable, I think it said. Yeah, that one. Favorable. Yeah. Yeah. Favorable. So that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, I plan to do this in Diva Worm this week, so that's why I was I saw it and I said this is Diva Worm material and then I'm gonna put it in the channel. So I, yeah, I I I'm aware of it. Uh, Sweet. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting for a number of reasons, but we'll see what it looks like. Uh, I usually just kind of like open it up and start going through it uh, in the meeting. And then, you know, I like to reflect on these things. Uh, so we'll probably talk about that next week, too. Um, Can you see the date of this paper? It's it a brand new, I think, yeah. I think 2023, I guess. Yeah. Go all the way to the top. This is in um, Biosystems. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, Biosystems 2023. I see this, but yeah. Um, All right. Sweet. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, when is Devo Worm? Maybe I'll try to join for this discussion. Um, Monday mornings at like uh, 10 o'clock Eastern. Okay. And you'll have one this Monday, even though it's Memorial Day? Yes. Yes. Sweet. Okay. I'll try to join. All right. Yeah. I'll try to join too. Great. Uh, um, yeah. So I guess in short, the human use of human beings reading group it has been going well. Um, and I feel like we've made plenty of connections between, um, I, I don't remember if I said it this way on Thursday, but there's something like timeless about the, the book. Um, yeah. mm. and it's timeless, like in virtue of him knowing that he's only speaking from one particular point in time. It's like, he's, yeah. a, he's aware of that context, but then what he ends up saying, there's like a, a kind of a timelessness to it. Yeah. So that's been the connections between that and we, machine learning came up, um, Breitenberg vehicles came up. So, yeah, I've been really enjoying, really enjoying the group. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite things about Norbert in particular. Well, like, and I, I kind of I waxed a little bit poetically about this at the end of the last meeting too. But I don't want to do it here too much, but like his father, like totally coerced him into being like heavily into humanity stuff so he has all this like weird like an overabundance of humanities and literature and classics and philosophy background that most people probably wouldn't have especially people who are going hardcore to like math and, and and cybernetic stuff or or like the system approach of it so this is a weird sense of like that but also what i really i really like his sort of i don't i don't think he's like I'm hesitant to call people like super geniuses or prod prodigy stuff, but like I think he's just uniquely situated to understand this sort of zeitgeist of almost like zeitgeist of technological affordances. And I feel like he speaks and also like at the beginning of the book, just to kind of throw way back to um uh maybe it's in here. 
um, if I can show this quickly. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of the book, there was a talk about um, uh, probably not that easy to find here. Um, maybe here at the very at, at the introduction of the book, the, the sort of talk about um, basically Norbert sees the 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 forward the preface is saying Norbert sees technology not just as like an implementation of of uh like I don't know technical things but but also applied ethics or applied philosophies too and I feel like all of that lends to a really valuable perspective I, I think I think Norbert's one of the first technology people that I've if you look at his like Wikipedia page or like like programming ethics, he's like the program like the first little programming ethics was like you know inspired by or like Norbert Weiner was one of the first programming ethicists, which is sort of like a precursor to like AI or technology ethics, I suppose. And I'm not I don't think he's like origin of that, but just the way that he's spoken about that, I think is a context that I feel I really appreciate. So I will step back from being a fanboy, but yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, um, let's return to innocence. Um, yeah, okay, Google Summer of Code, uh, and then we covered Bond Sustainable AI, I don't know if you want to talk more about that later, Bradley, um, or I can I'll just mention that. Briefly preview, okay. well, I'm not going to show the slides, um, but yeah. Uh, at, at, yeah, at, at um, we should actually be. Oops, to show up. Uh, there should be one from yesterday. I guess it's. I don't know where it is. Um, but anyway, we, we met yesterday, and it was nice because we we, we went through. I think we just saw some previous stuff with some of um, Rishali's, uh, I don't know if Raj presented or not, I forget, I wasn't quite no. everything, but I, I mean, he just gave an update, but, um, end of the community period, so we're actually going to start coding next week, I believe, right? Well, the coding starts, yeah, coding period starts next week. Like officially, anyway. At the end of this, um, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's moving forward, and that'll continue for the rest of the summer. So um, I imagine we'll have some updates here in this meeting over time as, from that as well, but people are welcome to come Friday to check out the Google Summer Code slash open source um, meetings that we have there. Yeah, um, we have Friday mornings at, uh, or actually Friday at noon Eastern time in North America. So that's evening in India, and that's morning in the Pacific region. So, uh, yes, yeah, Rishali, I, yes, you, we'll get to that in a minute. So, yes, you can give the presentation in a little bit. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and so, yeah, this is just, you know, we talk about different things. It's usually a place for the interns to talk about their updates and that, but I usually talk about different things. I also talked about a paper, um, the Metaverse for Science paper. I know Jesse mm -hmm. wasn't there for that, but uh, it was at the end of the meeting. So, and that was, yeah, in the GSOC channel. Yeah, I, I did not get to see that. I had to a step bit away more. from that, but it looks, it looks very... Actually, it's uh, not the paper. That's a different paper. Oh, whoops. Uh, yeah, go up to that one. Promises right. and Pitfalls of the Metaverse for Science. And that's, we talked about that paper. That, that's actually a good paper to kind of revisit uh, more generally because it talks a lot about, like, how we think about using VR and XR and AR for scientific applications. They have some pretty good, uh, they laid a pretty good roadmap for that. Um, and like I said in the meeting, you know, it's, it's uh, the technology is always changing. So what can we like find that's like 
uh, above the technological platforms? Like, what are the trends that, no matter what the platform, or no matter how the technology advances, what are the major themes or the major challenges? And so they kind of hit on this, I think, for just for like science, uh, like if you're running a lab or if you're in a scientific field, how can you use this to improve things? Um, they have like, if you go down a little bit, they have a table or figure. Uh, yeah, box one, go down. This one? Yeah, so they have a bunch of key challenges. Uh, and th I think these are actually also, there's overlap with society, ethics, and technology because there's some things about privacy and corporate control and resource disparities, biases, and discrimination. So, I don't, I don't know if that talk was recorded or not, but I'll yeah, I'll to yeah, it paper. was. Okay. It's it should be on the YouTube channel. Um, okay. Yeah. And then, All right. uh, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, that's, that's most of my, my, my updates and project management and everything else. So I don't know. I'll... So the bond sustainable AI, I, uh, I'm going to present that for the group. Uh, it'll be Thursday. So, I mean, like my time at six in the morning. And I have to, mm. but I'm going to record it and put it on the YouTube channel. And then I'll, I'll actually give the recording or play the recording during the session. And then, you know, it'll be there and I'll try to, um, you know, it'll be on the YouTube channel. You can watch it. It'll be, the slides are already done. So I, I actually, in, the, in my, yesterday's GSOC meeting, I talked about the slides. I showed them off. So I'm not going to show them here, but it's, um. It's quite interesting. It goes through all the stuff we did with open source sustainability last year and, you know, talks about the sustainability auditing tool, but it, it focuses more on the cybernetic aspect of it, which I didn't, I didn't realize that the actual uh, abstract submitted was about the sustainability tool itself. I had forgotten about that, but it's okay because it kind of does fit into that. Because other than like saying it's an auditing tool, what does that mean? So I kind of get into that. And uh, it's just basically what we've done, like the preprint that we have on, on that project, open source sustainability, it's basically that, you know, laid out a little bit more, you know, PowerPoint friendly format. So, um, so that's what's going to happen this week. And next week, I'll probably talk about it more as well. Yeah. All right. So uh, we had, hello, Vrushali. Uh I'll get to you in a minute. Uh, I have Amanda's update here that she put in the chat a while back. So my update, uh, human use of human beings is going well. Feel free to join even if you haven't been able to join on the previous ones. So we do this meeting every other week on Thursdays. Uh, it's like 7 o'clock Eastern time in North America, 7 p.m. So it's not, uh, you know, if you're in North America, you can probably make the meetings. Uh, if not, or maybe like East Asia or Australia, if you're in Europe or India, it's going to be too late. Uh, but that's okay. We usually record these. Yeah, they're, they're live streamed and they're on, they're on my YouTube um, so, and, and what's nice is that they're not kind of, <coughs> excuse me, kind of what we want to try to do, um, in the future and what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is like some of some, like the Cognition Futures Reading Group and some other specific things are often really deep in the weeds in a way as well, kind of just like, it almost be like live streaming a maker space who's like learning how to do the technology outright so it's not really great viewing sometimes um but when we're talking about an objective thing like a book that's been written it's much easier to have a externally facing discussion where we all feel kind of okay about what we're saying and it's like free space to bring ideas to 
And I think, I think I'm really enjoying that. And I know there's been talk about a phenomenology reading group and some other things. Um, but what's nice is that, yeah, you can, anybody can kind of like jump in on this. You don't have to read the whole book or like we're having discussions right now about like, um, you know, progress and, and, and technology and entropy and all this stuff. And, and these bigger, bigger themes that are relevant to both society, ethics, and, technology and a lot of other things too. So, um, definitely just join, join that group. Or even if you just watch, even honestly, if you just watch the recaps for those who haven't been able to make it and leave comments on the YouTube, um, you're welcome to do that. We can, you know, I'd be happy to have feedback and participation asynchronously too. Um, but, it, but it's nice that it's going well. And I think there's some excitement for kind of bridging that out. And I kind of mentioned things like the just orthogonal lab discussion series or something about that in the future that I would like to make happen more. Um, but this has really been a good test run. So yeah, and big thanks to, um, this is really Amanda's spearheading this. And I know I'm kind of doing some of the, like, I don't know, administration -y stuff for it, but it's, 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 it's Amanda's like brainchild and baby and, and she's doing great job leading stuff. So thank you Amanda for like, saying you want to do this and showing leadership and initiative and, and making it happen and, and leading discussions. Like it's, it's really fun to see that. And it's fun for me because I get to be a little bit more of a passenger. And, and I think we're having a lot of meaningful discussions and I'll okay, get different people come and go, uh, but always happy to have more folks join us live or asynchronously. So good stuff. Yes, thank you, Amanda, for your leadership on this. This has been a good experience so far. Uh, we've done about three of them, so. Uh, but, you know, it's like, it's good to have that kind of, you go through the book and you go chapter by chapter, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we go through a chapter very slowly, and so that's great. Uh, so, Cognition Futures has been great. An abstract will be coming out of that soon. We talked about that abstract for the philosophy of science as a mind. Uh, I'm looking forward to Bradley's information theory talk you mentioned a few times. Yeah, that's yet to be uh, revealed, but it's a pretty wide-ranging talk. I'm just kind of working out, like, basically we had an issue come up in Cognition Futures, I think, where we were talking about, or I guess it was from this meeting as well, where we are talking about um, information entropy and thermodynamic entropy and, and the relationship between them. And I've, I've kind of always been interested in this, but I've not done a deep dive. So I have been doing a deep dive into it and putting it into like a context that the lab would appreciate. Uh, so I'm working on that. I've got a lot of slides in it, so I'll, I might just release it to YouTube and then talk about it in the meetings in a more focused way. Like, you know, um, have like, you know, maybe take some slides out and show them, go through them more deeply. So I haven't decided how I'm going to do that yet, but it should be interesting. Um, it's, it's an area where there's been a lot of work, but I think there's still some interesting opportunities too. So, uh, so yes. Uh, well, thank you, Amanda, for that update. And thank you, Jesse, for the update. And now, Vrishali. Hello. How are you? Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. I will share the screen. Okay. Yeah. Start. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I can see the screen. Yes. There you go. Great. Um, can I see? Okay. Yes, it's visible. Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about the topic that will take us the journey of the senses, the world of virtual reality that's all about our project is uh, okay uh, here is our logo orthogonal research lab that's kind of 
and virtual world looms as reality fades into digital dreams. Imagination is more important than knowledge, uh, like what Albert Einstein said. For knowledge, it is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. Uh, I, I definitely agree with this. Like virtual reality has all its possible ways to give us a whole new world of imagination. Next, uh, virtual reality is in my name. Yeah, that's VR Kushali. Now it's in my hand. Like, I'm happy that I got that project, this virtual reality project. And our organization, uh, Orthogonal Research and Education Lab, is the distributed community of investigators pursuing interdisciplinary research and open science while valuing the underpinning philosophy within the discipline and societal impact of advances in AI and other technologies uh, with projects snapping uh, computer science, biology and neuroscience and cognitive science and philosophy. We foster collaboration and community across diverse field of study alongside development as researchers, educators and science communicators. Overall was established in 2014 by Director of Science, Dr. Bradley. Next, uh, there are multiple types of realities. Uh, the XR, the whole it comprises of XR is the extended reality, which uh, uh, which which we have known like XR is the extended reality. Uh, mm, what am I saying? Sorry. Uh, which has AR, VR, MR in it. AR means augmented reality. Uh, we use Snapchat filter, Instagram filter. We always have this AR with us. Like we have mobile screens like every time. Virtual reality is when we use uh, other thing like headset, clothes, or uh, uh, like whatever we have to get that immersive feeling and MR is when AR, VR mixed up. That's what we call mixed reality. Next, virtual reality for distributed research. This is what our topic is for GSOC. The applications of virtual reality and augmented reality in scientific research and education are limitless. Virtual realities allow researchers to create realistic environments that replicate real life scenarios. These scenarios can be used to collect the data that may be difficult or impossible to obtain in the real life, real world. Table of the contents. First, the project. We are for distributed research. Next. Uh, second, requirements. Technology will be used. Like, I will be this technology to make the project goals. The third one is the project goals. Like, what are the projects I have? There are three templates in this VR project, which is ABM model, uh, bioprocessors, and uh, Morris Water Maze experiment. Sneak peek. Like, how will I will make this? Uh, project and the within the time frame like what I will be doing is like this week like next week and like next next week and next is fifth stages like first evaluation there will be on maybe July and next will be the last one at the end of the August and our team uh, mentor Bradley and Jesse and me contributor What's VR? Virtual reality is the computer-generated simulation of the 3D environment that can be interactive with using spatial electronic equipment such as the headset or gloves. It allows users to experience a sense of presence in a artificial world often used for gaming, education, training and entertainment purposes. Next, virtual reality distributed research. We have these four things within our mind, uh, ABM, uh, virtual brain, like brain atlas, 
uh, open worm and Morris water means experiment. Uh, ABM I can make with the help of Gamma platform, ABMU which is the Unity platform agent based model toolkit uh, and the 2D net logo platform. For Brain VR, a Blender and Unity XR, Morris Water Maze Experiment, I will be using Blender and Unity XR and ABM. Uh, and for open worm blender and unity xr about the project the plan is to create an immersive environment for biological processes such as nervous system respiratory system many more if we have a bunch of mechanism in our whole body we can do that with the help of uh, graphic engine and uh, blender a uh, simulation of ABM model in NetLogo or Unity or uh, ABM or uh, Gamma platform, which is 3D ABM platform. And last, interactive subject, which will be conscious about its surrounding, like Morris Water Maze experiment. Uh, we will have that rat in the pond. He has to find the path to reach his destination this whole idea is here uh technology yeah i have said this vr headset haptic feedback which will the goal of the project like incorporating with these things blender 3d modeling tool unity 3d xr like graphic engine which is the graphic engine abm software we have abmu uh, gamma platform and net logo web xr is open gl gl these things agent based simulation agent based model simulation allow researchers to create models of complex system and observe how they behave under different conditions in uh, in a way that allows researchers to interact with them and collect data this can help researchers to better understand complex systems and develop solution to problem in fields such as ecology, economics and social sciences and even biological sciences if that's possible, I don't know, but we will do that. Uh, this is the flow of the ABM simulation, like how I'm going to make this, the whole flow chart I have made and put it on my proposal. So this is it. And next is biological processes. Virtual reality can also be used to replicate complex biological processes in a way that is it easy to understand. For example, an animation that displays biological processes from multiple points of view can help learners to visualize and understand complex processes that are difficult to understand in textbook. I, I always used to hate that biological classes like these whole mechanism we used to learn but now i understand that it can be more interactive and funny we can say that but now we have the solution here uh here we have the flow chart for biological process like how i'm gonna make this next is morris water maze experiment the morris water maze experiment Rats are placed in the pool of water in a hidden platform. The rats are trained to locate the platform using visual cues in the environment. This environment can be replicated in the virtual environment, allowing researchers to manipulate the environment, visual cues, and observe the rats' behavior. This type of research is not only be more ethical but also less costly and time consuming. We can do this in VR, WebEx, uh, yeah, WebGL thing. This is the flowchart for water, uh, Morris Water Maze experiment. Next, this is the poem I wrote for like, uh, in what we say, blog post. Like, I will say this, I like this one. Uh, dancing minds, immersive sites, a world of knowledge in XR slides. From ABM's view to Brain's Atlas, 
open source magic a poetic apparatus join us in the realm of 3d where scientific truths come to be the morris water meets to worms browser a vr ar world a scientific shower step into the realm of xr where haptic feedback takes you far a world of wonder a world of art join us now and play your part please join us in this process uh, and deliverables like what will be at i will have at the end of the project and open source model of biological processes such as respiratory system nervous system etc for making accessible immersive learning all around the globe and integrated agent based model simulation in logo abmu like whatever with the help of uh, we have like abm platform net logo abmu or gamma platform uh, with 3d physics and graphic engine using first and third person perspective a famous experiment a paradigm like morris water maze where the subject can interact with both environment and stimuli the environment stores participant data to be collected and with exhibit a high degree of environmental realism this include haptic feedback and sound effect for making it more realistic a web interface at first like webgl so people who don't have headset can also use this webgl webxr acting as a playground to tweak the agents and environment proper documentation yeah documentation is the most important thing to people to know what it is about why it is about how we are going to use this program and test for all components mentioned above yeah i will be running lots of it's uh why is it important the ultimate outcome of these projects should be a xr application published under an open source license that runs on widely available formats such as 360 video smartphone headset or meta quest the application should allow should allow for and measure haptic feedback and movement inputs like imagine being able to interact with the digital world in real time right in front of you imagine being the able to merge the physical world with the virtual world and experience objects that you wouldn't able to uh, do in real life well that's the ai vr is about it's no longer just the gaming and entertainment business now we can embrace ar vr and excel in the future for education and research this is the timeline uh yesterday i had like the shuffle way now i have like in more detail like what i will be doing week 1 to week 4 like bi the biological processes or the morris water maze experiment yesterday i talked with bradley he said that that morris water maze experiment will be much easier so i can shift here or there so this is the timeline uh by the end of week 10 or 11 i will have nearly completed um the project this is the whole uh timeline a uh, week wise so the first evolution the first by the end of the first evolution we will have a uh, we we are web version uh abm model with 3d physics uh 360 video and uh 3d assets and animation of nervous system or any biological uh system and morris water maze experiment uh this is uh uh this is week 7 8 9 10 11 11 and the final evolution what we will have finishing the project and documentation we will have a haptic feedback uh data collection and audio and web xr versions uh by the end of this uh project we will have abm like uh, agent based model simulation in any of the platform we have and deployment of ar vr application on github and i am thinking about if uh we can add in our bibli oral uh, 
website so whenever someone visit our website he will check out our projects and see that yeah th here we also have like a little bit and the final submission of the project project goal will be these three goals um, abm biological process and more is water maze next uh, global work like i will be doing global work of course this is my first project i will be doing globally uh, we have in usa bradley and jc and i am in india Vishali here uh, this opportunity will help me to enhance my technical skills of course lots of like learning and provide me with the opportunity with the work on real world projects that can benefit researchers and learners worldwide i am excited to be the part of the open source community and contribute to the development of cutting edge technology i'm determined to work hard and deliver quality work that meets the project requirements i'm all excited for this project like this is the starting but yeah at the same time i'm also nervous a mentor i'm uh, excited to be working with my lead mentor bradley Alice and JC Parent, who will guide me throughout the project. I'm confident that their expertise and guidance will help me and make significant progress and achieve the project goals within the stipulated timeline. Hope so. Thank you in advance. Uh, this is a, my previous work. Like I have, blend, I have done so many Blender projects, but I just put it here. The sunset animation picture uh the next one is the viral disease uh which i made like the first made in abm net logo abm stimulation in net logo and this is the unity 3d game i have made which is which i play on regular basis mm, maybe yes. and about me i am um, first year undergraduate at IITM, IIT Madras, a pursuing Bachelor of Science in Research in Data Science and Programming. I have interest in computational neuroscience, data science, XR, programming. Yeah, these things are more diverse than I think ever thought about, but yeah, that's what I have. And thank you for listening to me and let's connect um, if you ever want to connect me. Here I am. Uh, social media accounts and email plus if you ever have question about this so reach me out feel me to reach me out thank you that's it oh great well thank you <laughs> yeah that's great um <coughs> excuse me i'm glad that you went through all that i mean i know it's it's um it's a very good, uh, exactly what we wanted to have for like, this is your first thing that you're doing here is laying everything out. Um, and it'd be really fun to compare this presentation to the one you make at the end of the year. Um, and then like a lot of the fun is, is doing that. And especially right now, if you haven't done this before or not used to presenting this way or talking about a topic, you don't really haven't done, you, you, it's a bit nebulous right now, but this is a great, um, reference point and also like just getting used to doing it so it, it, was, it was exactly what it should be yeah yeah i like that i like a lot of the visuals and that you kind of hit on some of the things you're doing but like sort of the motivation and then your portfolio you know to show a little bit of that um yeah so i mean like i mentioned yesterday you're going to have like this project is going to be a little bit more flexible than the other project because this is where we were proposing to do like three things and you know you, you'll kind of figure out which one is easier to do and then try to hit the low hanging fruit first so if that means you work a little bit on each project and, and try to drive one forward first like maybe morris water maze is easier the easiest to do and you work on that and then you get the the point being i want by the end of the summer we'd like to have at least one thing completed uh and then if we can complete two or three that would be great but you know at least one and then you hit the low hanging fruit 
and then try to drive the easiest one to completion. And then the others, try to drive those as far as you can. And then, um, you know, that's that, that would be enough for one summer. That's one of the uh, drawbacks of, of GSOC projects is that they only last a summer. So you don't have <laughs> infinite time to work on them. If you have outstanding issues, you just have to create those issues. And, you know, if you can get back to them, fine. If not, it's kind of tough in that way. But, you know, we... I yesterday I presented a roadmap for our lab strategic goals for VR and XR and so Rushawi knows what that is and so um, this is pretty well aligned with that yeah it's great thank you once again for presenting um, yeah yeah and a note I'm presenting too like Rochelle is doing this as part of Google Summer Code, but for a lot of people, um, and I, I know some people I've been invited to join the lab, but like it's really great to just this is this is a really good space to to get used to presenting. And we want to encourage as much as possible. It can be flash talks, it can be longer things like that, but we don't always have a bunch of them all the time. Um, but I, I think it's important that we emphasize for people who want to get used to that or build that up as a as a practice. Um, who aren't necessarily in in the lab or who aren't, aren't um, presenting actively here, like you're welcome to do that. And it's a great thing to do. So it's very good that Rishali did that here. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna move on here uh, to some things I wanted to talk about. Um, so first thing is that I, here we go. So, Let's see, this is the sustainable AI presentation. This is the cover slide, uh, so you get an idea of what this is. This is this open source sustainability um, project, an agent-based cybernetic approach. Uh, there are participants, basically, Jesse and myself, who were uh, doing the, uh, you know, mentoring last year, and then Brian Vukorko, Hussein Aether, and Himanshu Shogol, and they all participated in GSOC last year and all produced software that is featured in this talk. So this will walk through the three platforms, how it kind of fits in. They're all agent-based models, how it fits into this larger approach of like cybernetic regulation uh, of behavior in these open source communities and how that leads to sustainability perhaps. And then going into the auditing tool, which we haven't really developed very much that's what uh, uh, Raj will be doing this summer uh, to try to get that driven forward. But this is a nice uh, introductory talk to it. I hope that um, you know that we can use that and the preprint as sort of a, a way to sort of advertise this. You know, so the idea is once you build something, you don't want to just let it sit there. You want to promote it. You want to what they call be an evangelist, which, you know, is basically, you know, go out and talk about it to people or to present on it or to, you know, don't, don't over promise or don't oversell it, but just give it some, you know, press on your own. So this is one way to do that, giving talks, giving, doing a preprint where you can just give it to someone and say, this is our vision for this project. This is what we've done. And, um, you know, and with like a startup, they might be a lot flashier than we are. But um, again, sometimes that's not great because sometimes it's sort of this overpromising aspect where people say, you know, this is the greatest thing. This will transform the world. And it really isn't that. <laughs> so I don't know. I take a, a, a bit more skeptical view of that. But uh, in any case, you know, this is good that we get this out here and, uh, Hopefully we can get, you know, an update to this talk maybe next year, but we'll see. So that's uh, the sustainable AI presentation. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is this, uh, actually I'll talk about this one first. This is something that Morgan, I think, posted in one of the Slack channels. Um, oh, this isn't it. This is... I can't remember what channel it was. It could have been like developmental AI or it could have been 
Well, I can't remember where it was, but um, no. Uh, in any case, it's uh, this blog post from Developmental Systems. So this is the Flowers Lab at Inria, and we've talked about these people before. Um, they do a lot of stuff with what you might call developmental AI. They do a lot of stuff with um, like developmental systems and artificial intelligence. So this is one of their blog posts. Uh, this is on a paper I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, this is Designing Artificial Conversational Agents to Train Children's Curiosity During Learning, a proof of concept through Kids, Asks, Kids Ask Project. So they're basically designing chatbots, but not the chatbots that uh, we know as LLMs, really. These are just uh, run-of-the-mill chatbots, I believe, conversational agents. And they're used to train uh, children's curiosity during learning. So this is this Kids Ask project, and I don't know if uh, Morgan has any more information about that. If you could put it in the chat, that would be good. Uh, but there is there are a couple things. If you go to the blog post... They have a conference talk, uh, and they have this paper I'll talk about. <clears throat> so this is in a journal, this paper, Conversational Agents for Fostering Curiosity Driven Learning in Children. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to probe this uh, concept called curiosity. So this is a key factor for enhancing learning experiences and outcomes. Curiosity is defined as a desire to know. See your experience that motivates exploratory behavior oriented towards the acquisition of new information. So as you can imagine, curiosity is a pretty important part of learning. But a lot of learning, we don't think about curiosity as a, sort of a variable that we're interested in. We talk about things like explore, exploit, or we talk about like, you know, um, accuracy or re recall or things like that, um, and, or acquisition. But curiosity is also a part of this as well. So, and curiosity, of course, is very developmentally salient. So when you're uh, a child, you, you're very curious about things. You want to know how things work. You don't know anything about, say, like a box or like a bicycle or, you know, what's in a television. You don't, you're not born with that information. You need to learn it. Now, you can sit down and you can study a schematic, but most kids don't do that. Um, you play with it, you explore it, and you do whatever you need to do. Uh, if you're young enough, you might try to put something in your mouth, but it's usually just kind of exploring it. And then, you know, making these hypotheses, like, you know, uh, it could be something outlandish until you finally figure out what's going on. And so that's that's what curiosity is. And it's all part of this process, and they're trying to here they're trying to use a chatbot to sort of probe what's going on. So given its importance for learning, several recent studies have focused on the study of curiosity in the classroom with the goal of designing pedagogical interventions, which means just in the classroom having a teaching strategy that can foster the civility in young children. These observations showed that it is indeed a malleable skill that can be elicited by verbal and nonverbal cues, hence the use of a chatbot. By promoting comfort with uncertainty and encouraging questioning and exploration to resolve it. However, and despite different efforts, recent reports show that today's educational content does very little to encourage children to be curious, generally reducing them to one correct answer and not allowing them enough space to ask questions and explore the main expressions of epistemic curiosity. So this is like, you know, you can think about this, if you think about this as like, you know, something like science or something like philosophy, where you're doing things like asking questions and exploring, they need to be correct. This is the adult version of that. It's very structured curiosity. Like in, when, in children, you're free, freely exploring things, and sometimes adults do that too. But in the educational context, you know, you're trying to ask questions and explore the world that you don't know. And so this is all, you know, kind of the the criticism they make of education here is that we don't do enough of this. And so uh, the curiosity during learning, the major breaks, 
questioning behaviors, which are the primary expressions of this in children, are almost absent in today's classrooms. Uh, there's this knowledge illusion, children's tendency to overestimate their knowledge levels and not be aware of the information they might be missing. I think that's true of adults as well. There's this notion of knowledge gaps, which means that you don't you miss things because you think you know enough about things. And so there is this tendency to not explore things that you think you already know enough about. So this is where, you know, you have this issue of uh, studying the schematic and saying, OK, I understand things and then not having any curiosity as to whether, you know, there are things that you can learn beyond that or like learn about the system. So, you know, that can apply to meta learning as well. Uh, so this kind of goes through the Kids Ask project is this project that leverages new technologies and proposes a curiosity training based on the awareness of knowledge gaps. Uh, they had this design where they had a curiosity stimulation space. The agent offers quizzes on different topics and tries to make students aware of gaps in their knowledge uh, by encouraging them to report confidence levels in the answers they give. Uh, curiosity elaboration space. Our agents aim to help children go one step further than the identification of uncertainty. We want to train them to know how to express these uncertainties and being able to pursue them by asking the appropriate questions. Uh, and then finally, uh, curiosity maintenance space. In order to help children stay in curious states, our agents encourage them to mobilize their questioning abilities to explore educational resources available on the platform and perform autonomous, organized, and personalized investigations. So you want to train children to take time to evaluate the new information they acquire and ask themselves if they are satisfied with it or if it raises new questions in them. So this is as opposed to saying, I know enough, or you know, this is enough that I can operationally do something, but I don't really get any deeper into the material than that. So this is a figure here. This is just an illustration of what they're doing, where you have this external stimuli, uh, and then there's the chat bot. Do you know what the largest constellation is? And then the child says the Big Dipper. And then there's this awareness of missing information. So there is a prompt to the human. How confident are you about your answer? They give an answer. Uh, then the chat bot does this elaboration of curious thinking. Here's a text about constellations. Can you think of a curious question about it? So they actually ask if there's a question instead of just leaving it up to the, the person, the learner. And then how many stars are there in the Big Dipper? That's the curious question. And then they give some cues, you know, where they keep probing the learner to say, what else do you think about this? Can you give uh, more detail? Things like that. And so you don't just leave it up to the learner. And then there's this autonomous information seeking behavior. You know, I can help you explore more interesting resources if you guide me with your classroom curious questions. And then the learner says, I'm curious, what are stars composed of? And then here is a list of interesting resources. And then the learner says, I would like to see the video about stars. And so this is kind of almost like what we do here in the lab to some extent. I mean, if we structure it like this, I think we'd have some interesting, uh, you know, we might drive some interesting questions because we're engaging in these areas that are pretty deep for a lot of people. And they're learning things and it's like, okay, well, you know, we can give people enough background to get through like a lecture or to get through a class, but there's this curiosity aspect that needs to be kind of built out. Like, you know, you need to have this uh, infrastructure. So which paper is this? So this is this blog post, uh, Designing Artificial Conversational Agents to Train Children's Curiosity During Learning. This was in one of the the Slack channels, and I can't remember which one Morgan put it in, but um, in any case, it's in there, and I can post it to the general channel. But this is this is a blog post, and then there's a paper, <clears throat> which is this one. This is the International Journal of Human Computer Studies. This is uh, from 2022, and this title is Conversational Agents for Fostering Curiosity-Driven Learning in Children. And uh, Pierre Yves Odier is one of the people we've talked about before. He's an author on this. 
and a bunch of people from INRIA and even the University of Waterloo in Canada. So there's a nice, uh, nice group of collaborators on this. So, uh, so this paper kind of gets into what the blog post talked about. Um, they did, they had these conversational agents. They asked children about their learning experience. They generated curiosity driven questions. They encouraged them to use their lead autonomous explorations to gain new knowledge. They used 51 primary school students between ages 9 and 10. So these are children who are learning. They're not young children, but they're not teenagers. They're kind of in that in-between period where they've interacted with either a neutral agent or an incentive agent that help carry out driven questioning. So I guess this means that the agent is either sort of just asking questions passively or they're actually incentivizing the student to learn more uh, by offering specific semantic cues. Results showed a significant increase in the number and quality of the questions generated with the incentive agent. So as you get, you know, you, you give them a higher stake in the thing, they actually will ask questions that are more sort of richer this interaction also resulted in longer explorations and stronger learning progress. So this actually goes to metacognition. So our results suggest that the more our agents are able to train children's curiosity-related metacognitive skills, which is that learning about learning or that metacognition level, the better they can maintain their information searching behaviors and the more new knowledge they're likely to acquire. So it looks like uh, we got a thumbs up from Jesse. Yeah. Oh, skin in the game. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm vaguely referencing the Taleb. I think it's Nikolai yeah. Taleb book. But but more broadly, like I, the book, yes, but also like the concept in general of like, and th this is this is super related to I, for for those. Some people may know this about me, some people may not. One of my like bigger, longer term thing is like exactly this thing of what is it? What are these things that sort of affect uh, like affordance perception or affordance, um, I don't know, like catalysts. I don't know how to really call them right now. But in this case, skin in the game is something that would incentivize um, you know, like like there'd be some something worth it. Like there's there's incentives in, in a really simple version of this. I don't know. I'm not. I haven't read the paper, obviously, but but the concept of is really interesting and relevant to some of my longer term things of metacognitively. How how do you? I'd be really curious. I don't think the paper is going to go into this, but like, how does what incentive structures affect? I guess as, as a saying in this paper, the metacognitive development of this, and and how does that affect literacy? Kind of like even as a throwback, even as a throwback to. Um, I'm gonna, I, I won't bring it up, but for those of who are in the meeting, the um, gesture of awareness related meetings for Curtis Peters Reading Group. If you recall, I said something specifically about literacy of correlates. And this is related to that too, in a metacognitive sense, where I, I was in the context of mastery and mastering the gesture of awareness and familiarity with the gesture of awareness and how easy it is to complete that when someone is like more trained and more experienced and like, okay, I can go through this process of be becoming aware as, in, in the language of like Varela and such, which is very specific meanings, for those that don't know it. Um, but why I mentioned this in the context of literacy of correlates is very much associated with this to me in that uh, developing a literacy of it's sort of like what I'm very 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 interested in the role of incentives that are related to things that can lead to generation of metacognitive context that can lead to association of these correlates like these things what I mean by correlates are these sort of like, if we're going to kind of use a little bit of language of mental movement through, if we're going to say movement through like awareness 
or the gesture of awareness is related to sort of mirrored by physical movement through things. And sort of like these landmarks or these reference points around you that maybe aren't necessarily directly your experience, but are understanding how your relationship to the information or the inputs you're receiving changes or, or has more literacy. So I know it's a bit of a vague thing to say, but it's, it's a very specific reference to the gesture of awareness thing. And also this comes up in general. So I'm really, between this and the other paper, which I, I had to step away and couldn't see that, uh, really um, interesting stuff that I want to look into more. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll put these in the uh, Slack. But let's see. So when they say metacognition, of course, we should define metacognition because I don't know if everyone in the group knows kind of what that is. Uh, so there's, uh, let's see if they define metacognition in the... Uh, text in the review here so I mean I don't know if we have a def good definition here I'm not sure but uh, how would you define metacognition Jesse um, I mean the simplest ways of something are like thinking about thinking um, or, or like the what, like Megan K. Peters studies metacognition at UCI, and she's a philosopher, neuroscience, cognitive science, cognitive science area person, and she's she's trying to attack it from neuroscience specifically, and just you know she's been kind of looked. Uh, one I remember one of her interviews was like, oh, you, you get you're actually getting to do like some actual real consciousness research because you don't always eat. That's not exactly the biggest field. Um, to get like funded for and, and you know acclaim or like do specific stuff and so she's able to do some of that and her approach from what little I know of it is sort of a, a big thing is like confidence and like how confident are you about this assertion or this claim or this thought or this evidence like it's sort of the you have you have this a conclusion or a feeling or something and then it's well to what it's not I don't think it's just fair to say a spectrum of, you know, like hot or cold or strong yes, strong no, uh, me, you know, and the neutral. But sort of this, um, I almost want to use a little bit of the word valence here, which is, isn't is maybe one aspect, but not a great one to do. But, but to kind of be a little simpler, it's just confidence about that which you are entertaining in your, in, in your mind. So that's one way to say it. I think there are some other ways to talk about it too. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a very good fit to what they're talking about in this paper. So, you know, they talk about uh, some of these question, this question asking training space uh, where they're asking questions of the child or the learner. Um, so, you know, you kind of give them specific cues and you have to prompt. It's like the, we talk about in the uh, AI space with large language models, you have to prompt them with prompts. The prompts have to be very specific. And the same is true, of course, with cognition. You can't just ask an open-ended question and get an answer. Um, you can do th things like uh, Socratic inquiry, but like, you know, that has its place. It doesn't necessarily drive curiosity. It's just kind of, if you know a domain pretty well, maybe you can get a good answers out of it. But, you know, if you're, what they're doing here is basically teaching some concept and then trying to push the amount of curiosity forward so that people can learn more, you know, in, the, in a way that's, that means something to them. So there's the exploration space and then the evaluation space. So you give them room to explore, you prompt, you give, have a library of knowledge so that, you know, whatever they really want to know, they can get access to. And then the evaluation space, so you can see if people are learning these things so if that that intervention is effective and so i think that's good this is the same figure we saw this is a good example of metacognition i think where you're actually probing uh people's learning ability and you know you're giving them an opportunity to think about what they're thinking about and uh because they're actually evaluating their confidence in something and then they're they're acting on that and saying okay i need to learn more about this it's very hard to really do self-evaluation just by 
thinking, asking yourself questions. You sometimes need an external prompt. Sometimes that's a teacher, but sometimes a chat bot is better because you can have like a very systematic way to do that and just kind of interact at a very basic level where you're giving just exactly the right prompts to get the, you know, to elicit the kind of curiosity you want to get and, and drive learning forward. So that's that paper. I, I think that's uh, I think that's useful for some of the conversations we've had, of course, with metacognition and some of the other developmental learning things that we've talked about. Yes, um, I think I think that's mm, there. There were two things. There's sort of there's sort of two things that are on like in the background of a lot of stuff we're talking about lately or one of one of them is this whole subject is sort of this metacognitive developmental stuff and i don't really know what to call that i don't know if that i don't know where that fits in with things it's kind of like across like kurdish futures and some of the uh, de dev ai stuff and and may i don't know physics but like like this there's a, there's a very specific something there um and even before I was going through the Slack and saw something else about like Morgan posted something about um the chronic pain can be objectively measured by brain signals thing. And that's mm -hmm. that's another one of those things in the background that I want to do a little bit more of about like chronic pain, disability, neurodivergence is sort of another topic, but that's 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 not that's that's separate from the papers we just talked about. Yeah. Yeah, I see it in the raw story. Uh, do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is it here. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we can talk about that if you want to If you want to present on it. I don't know. Um, oh, no, but... I, I don't have anything much to say. Oh, okay. Just, um, I, I happen to see it in the middle of all that, and then it's like, what do you... The, the, the two papers we just read, we, we, I feel like we can come back to it later, but the two papers we just discussed are like very, very relevant to plot pushes as well in the yeah. sense of play, like like a big thing, a big thing is sort of play and then sort of uh, play is learning, learning is play, play is experience, play growing and, and like having, having sort of, um, I've been really curious to read more of the paper and see how they, Oh, both papers actually the the blog post and the paper um in the sense of you know their their relationship to like structured play or like how are they doing like the nature of incentives and how are they using because you can incentivize someone to follow a very dogmatic or specific path right or are you incentivizing towards more combinatorial play more uh like actually um interfacing in non-scripted or more regular ways that that it, to put it in another way are you incentivizing almost like numbing out affordances and saying okay well here's the the one dogmatic solution to get to the the goal that i want and that's going to reward me or are you incentivizing actual affordance exploration? Are you incentivizing? Are you trying to grow curiosity? Are you rewarding the 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 like manipulation and exploration in non stand like non standardized ways uh, that, that to kind of try to differentiate those a bit? It's not quite that simple, but it, I think that's a really interesting lens that that sort of come up in. The plot twisters and other things too. Yeah, definitely a lot of things to explore there. Um, did we have any other comments on this before I move on? Okay. Well, yeah, we can talk more about that in the Slack. Um, so the other thing I wanted to get into is this thing on... Um, so I kind of previewed this before where we were talking about digital. We mentioned the term digital twins, and I wanted to get into this a little bit more. Uh, so there's this idea in VR that you need to 
capture, like if someone's wearing a headset and they're uh, interacting with the virtual world, you have to do two things, essentially. You have to capture motion and then you have to sort of simulate things, simulate the physics, simulate movement and those sorts of things. So this is an example of motion capture. So motion capture technology has traditionally been used in like uh, movies and entertainment where they capture uh, motion. This is where someone's walking on a uh, surface and this, the, you know, they have all these sensors that they're wearing on their head, on their arms and legs. And it's just capturing motion from different parts of their body. You have these degrees of freedom like the knee, the, the elbow, the head, the neck. And those are where the body articulates independently of the other parts. So you have to track those segments between those degrees of freedom to get realistic motion capture. So you're capturing, say, the upper arm movements, which are independent of the lower arm movements. And you're capturing the head movements, which are independent of the leg movements. And you can then map those to a digital avatar here where they're walking. You can actually simulate the walking from those those reference points so they get put in a reference space and the avatar can move and you get realistic movements uh, this is an example from a movie this is planet of the apes where you have an actor <clears throat> you're getting their facial expressions and if you look at the movie you know that you have like a an ape with a face that looks human and it's because they're capturing the motion of the face of the human the different muscles, uh, the different muscles, and and sort of their uh, movement points on the face, so they're able to take like video of it, capture the the movement between frames, and then uh, simulate this in a in a uh, you know in a movie in a, a graphics context. So this is an example. This is something else. This is this thing, holograms, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, this is just another example of motion capture. This is how it's usually done with, uh, you're in a room, you're in a green, like a green screen room, you have this mocap suit on, you have these sensors all over your body, and you have these cameras which pick up different angles, so you have the degrees of freedom. You have to have like three or four different angles at which you're capturing this information. They're usually these fiducial markers that get picked up as they move. The camera can register the movement and it can put together a film of these points, and then you can map them to different things. Uh, we had a question, maybe a comment. Oh, mocap, yeah, mocap. So that's a traditional mocap thing, but in virtual reality, we might want to do things with sensors, and we have sensor systems. Say, for example, in some of our headsets, we have room-based beacons that pick up like your position of your hands or your body, and there are different ways that people. That, that systems are doing that's so like MetaQuest is doing that with um, their uh, heads they have like hand tracking and head tracking the controllers have trackers on them the headset has trackers in them the uh, Vive uh, that's another platform they have beacons that they put in the room and you just lay them out and it tracks your body in different ways I watch many YouTube VTubers doing that and Avatar 2 is beautiful yeah so Avatar, they do a lot of that sort of thing. They map them to these avatars. I mean, that's kind of a more honest way of doing it than uh, some of the other applications. But yeah, but but in any case, um, that's mocap. That's traditional motion capture. Um, now, what we want to do in virtual reality is we want to create avatars. And the reason we want to create avatars like this is because we want to have digital representations of the body. And so we want to give them realistic movement. We want to interact with other avatars that represent people. And we want to make these really kind of three-dimensional, lifelike. We want to make them, you know, um, flexible so that they, you know, can uh, sort of rep represent your body. And sometimes you're doing things that, you know, they're different. You know, you have facial expressions, you have body movements. And that is part of, you know, nonverbal communication. So it's important to have that representation as realistically as possible. So realism is very important. So we have these things called volograms. That there's a company that's making these volograms. They're digital twins, which is a different thing. 
but there are also these volograms, and I'll talk about volograms in a little bit, but let me get into digital twins. So uh, a digital twin is something that, you know, we've de that's been developed in information technology. It's a virtual representation of an object or system that spans its life cycle. So, you know, you can make a digital twin of your computer or your desktop or a refrigerator, and the idea is to make a digital copy of it that's as realistic as possible. And so this is something you can use for uh, incorporating sensor data. So if you have a refrigerator, you can have sensors in the refrigerator that tell you all about the state of that object. The temperature inside, the temperature outside, the sort of the material integrity, uh, whether someone has the door open or not. There are all sorts of sensors that you can put on that device. And then you can make a digital twin. So you make the digital uh, asset, which is the three-dimensional model. And then you can incorporate sensor data. So you can actually simulate the temperature inside the freezer, inside the refrigerator, during when the door is open, when the outside temperatures are really hot when the, uh, you know, when it's full, when it's empty. You can get all this data via sensors and then you can populate your simulation. So you can simulate this and you can understand the system better. You can put a digit, make a digital um, representation of that object. So this is, these are digital twins more generally. You can do this for any kind of physical thing in the world. And one of those things, of course, are human beings. So you can actually create a human and now, when you talk about digital twins with humans, and, and sometimes with other systems as well, you can't make an exact copy because we don't know all of, you know everything there is to know about humans. We can simulate like cert a certain level of the human body, so we can have a three dimensional representation of the body, not necessarily the internal anatomy. You can have a representation of the behavior, but not necessarily what generates that behavior. So we, we've done this with like different, um, you know, we have different ways to simulate human behavior from agent-based models to, you know, if you know anything about The Sims video game, you know that they've done a lot of work with simulating, uh, you know, potential human behaviors. And so they've done this, this is sort of like a, a you can know, think of it as a digital twin of a human, but it's not like, you know, a, quite a twin and you're just trying to do that. So there are different types of digital twins. There are component twins where you have, you know, the component twin is a basic unit of a digital twin, the smallest example of a functioning component. Parts twins are roughly the same thing, but they pertain to components. Asset twins, or when two or more components work together, they're known as an asset. Asset twins let you study the interaction of these components. So you might have a component twin or a part twin might be like a refrigerator. Asset twins might be like a refrigerator and a stove. System or unit twins would be like a system of different twin digital twins. So you might have a whole kitchen of appliances and they're all simulated together. Then the process twins are how systems work together to create an entire production facility. This is useful in like a factory but you could think of this as like if you wanted to simulate the internal process in a body, you could make a twin of each organ and you could like it, you know, make a simulation of them interacting. So there are a lot of ways that people use digital twins in industry and in research and development and modeling sort of products and their lifespan. But we can model human beings in that way, too. Um and so this is another article about digital twins and why it's important to something called the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is this uh, set of objects in the world that are networked. So the Internet of Things are where you have appliances like televisions and refrigerators and cars that are all interact. They're not only like mapped to the virtual world, but they're networked. And so you have this Internet, this network of things that can talk to one another where they can, you know, you can understand the internal state over long periods of time and how these things behave. So it's very much a, um, you know, this is, uh, this is very much tied to digital twinning. And so they talk about how digital twins first arose in NASA. So NASA was the first to use digital twins where they made full-scale mock-ups of early space capsules 
used on the ground to mirror and diagnose problems in orbit. And this, these eventually gave way to fully digital simulations, but these digital twins are the objects within the simulation that, you know, you need to have that twinning to really understand the system. So, and then this became sort of part of the hype cycle in 2017. So people, you might read about digital twins and it's very hype oriented, but basically this is what we're trying to do. Uh, so to separate it from the hype, uh, so this is another article from NVIDIA and Digital Twins. They talk a little bit about this in the context of an auto assembly plant where you have these uh, digital twins as 3D objects, or actually 4D objects because you have time in, as well. And so uh, they kind of give you this definition. A digital twin is a virtual representation, a true-to-reality simulation of physics and materials, of a real-world physical asset or system which is continuously updated. So you're continuously updating your model. And um, you can use sensors. You can use those sensors like for movement. You can use all sorts of things. You could use even like cognitive sensors where you sense cognitive state of a human um, and make a virtual uh, avatar in that way. So that's digital twinning. Now, volograms, which I mentioned here, are a little bit different. This is kind of taking this concept and creating volumetric representations of human. Uh, so this is where they've recreated theater using volograms, which are these three-dimensional models of humans, actually four-dimensional models, because they do this over time. They kind of try to bring in as much information as possible, and they, they recreate, they're recreating this uh, interactive theater production in VR. So this is MWM's interactive chain to Victorian Nightmare is a pop-up arcade based on Charles Dickens' renowned tale, A Christmas Carol. It uses VR to immerse stout-hearted participants in a Victorian nightmare. So they're not just retelling a classic story. When participants are asked by performers to cross over, which means that they're putting their VR headset on, they become the central Scrooge character. So the person is actually in, in, immersed in this play. The participants' perception of reality changes, shifting the narrative and focus on themselves so they can tell their own story. Pioneering companies are already making inroads in this space using volumetric imagery with fascinating results. So what they're doing instead of doing uh, motion tracking in this case is they're actually creating a volume. So they're not just trading, they're not just tracking those uh, movement points on the limbs. They're actually creating a whole volume of a human. They're creating a point of view. They're simulating the experience as much as possible. They also have to track things like movement. And they're creating this world. So they're doing this thing with what they call a volagram. So this is the thing here, this Insights Hub article. I'll post this in the chat. Uh, so this is like the volume, this is creating the volagram this isn't just tracking the limbs like I should with mocap. This is actually creating a whole volume of the person and creating a virtual model of it. Um, and there's a company in Dublin called Volograms where they're turning real people into volumetric holograms. That's where the term volograms come from. And then this, uh, this can be used in a huge array of AR and VR experiences. So once you create one of these volograms from a real person, and here's some examples of holograms versus real people. You know, which ones are the real people? Actually, I think they're all holograms, but some of them look pretty real. Some of them are just kind of nondescript. But you can see that there are these uh -huh. volumes of the, they scan the whole body. They try to create this digital twin, and then they, they can use it for different things. And they can reuse it in different places. So it's not just for one production. Um, you can use this a number of times. You can use this for augmented reality, for virtual reality, and for mixed reality. So there's, it's very diverse in how you can use it. And of course, they use it in this play. They're recreating this experience, and you can participate in different ways. And, um, and you know, it's pretty good. So uh, that's, that's Volograms. Uh, there's also the potential to use Volograms in live sports broadcasts. So you can create a 3D model using one single image using Volograms AI. So this is merging AI into this, uh, and they're using it for live sports broadcasts. So this is a video on this. 
this is 3D reconstruction and semantic segmentation of like a, uh, one of these scans. So you're bas basically creating a volume of the person. You're figuring out how the person moves, how they behave, different things like that. And then they're able to put this into a, a sports context. Uh, so virtual production is making its way to live TV broadcast studios. Um, we are sure you've seen this in a broadcast, but if a producer wants to integrate a real human on the stage, it ends up looking like a cardboard cutout. So the quality of putting humans in these worlds has been very low. Uh, the camera operator needs to be very careful to avoid breaking these illusions. To make it more complicated, these images cannot be relit, cast shadows, or interact with other elements. That's why we want bolograms. In this case, we can simulate some of the behaviors with AI. We can have that three-dimensional representation, and we can actually treat it like a real object. We can cast shadows and do things like that. So they do this in the context of a sports studio. Here you can see a, a player that's being projected into this studio. They're running around. They're, you know, you can see it. It looks like it's real. It doesn't look fake, although maybe it does look a little fake. They're working on it. Um, and I, I know you've seen like Fox Sports. They do a lot of the, they've done a lot of these kind of gimmicks where they've like created little animations, and sometimes they look really crappy, and you know sometimes a little bit less crappy, but they're not great. These are improvements, I think, on what people have seen in the past. They're still not great, but you know this is why we want to try to play with these hologram ideas and see if we can get so. The dramatic camera movement that you see in these would not be possible without a two-dimensional billboard. Also check out the difference between one of our models and the traditional 2D billboards used today. The hologram not only reacts perfectly to the camera movement without tilting, so this I think is an example where it tilts. Uh, it even casts realistic shadows. And combining the models with camera tricks, okay this is the hologram here of these soccer players. Lighting effects and other 3D elements in the scene can take a broadcasting experience to a new level. So this is where they talk about this a little bit more. Um, and then finally, this is an article on holograms, making widespread AR and VR content a reality. This is where, you know, they're trying to like kind of plug these holograms into the metaverse. Um, this talks about this company from Dublin, Volograms Incorporated or Limited or whatever it is. Uh, you know, they're really, the, one of the big barriers to widespread AR adoption is the creation of content that is realistic and that can integrate with the real world. So this lack of content creation tools for regular users is a significant market opportunity that we need. So you can't really create custom content with the tools that we have in AR now. And more generally, AR doesn't have the tools to create things like really photorealistic humans. So, you know, or other objects. So this is where holograms can fill this void and then creating a tool that can allow us to build these in a way that's accessible to, to content creators that aren't like large corporations. So this is what they're trying to do here. And they've been somewhat successful, but this is the challenge. Um, and then, you know, you're doing volumetric video capture. This is suitable for most augmented reality, virtual reality applications. You can render the standard 3D content in these worlds. You can use artificial intelligence uh, techniques such as computer vision to, you know, build these models and to map them to a three, like a uh, stock 3D sort of form. So you can like fill out the form. You can use a template and fill out all the parts of the person that you want. You can customize it. But you can use AI, of course, in other ways. You can use other types of generative AI to do things. Um, so yeah, this is this talks about a little bit more about these uh, these holograms and how they work and, and how they're used in, in their company. They use things like LiDAR, which senses depth using invisible light pulses. So LiDAR can be used to align the model in the world and create some of these effects that make it seem more real. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's a good coverage of that. Uh, so that's holograms, uh, digital twins, and some allied things. Uh, yeah, so okay, uh, let's see. 
uh, Morgan said, uh, yes, there's a lot in healthcare for sure. And this is, okay, so this is actually, Jesse had something to say about hologram or volograms up here. Uh, what? Let's see. Yeah, this was the thing about incentives and metacognition. Yeah, we'll, we'll go, I'll go back to that later. Okay. I'll, I'll, we can All stay right. on topic for now and All right. talk about the volograms. So definitely want to see the foundry piece in more detail and insights up piece too. Yeah, I'll post those all in the Slack. Then regarding volograms, have you heard anything about applications for healthcare or health tech? With or potential digital twins, I, I'm not really like on the cutting edge of this area, but I'm sure. And then Morgan said, "Yes, there is a lot in healthcare for sure. Yes, I, I don't know again what those details are, but yeah, I'm pretty sure they use it in healthcare. Uh, but yeah, we should follow up on that. Um, and then Morgan said, somewhat overlapping with precision medicine. So we have a precision medicine where they're trying to kind of you know make healthcare uh, more sort of applicable to individuals um they're trying to do things like model the individual their their state their physiological state their cognitive state and certainly there are a lot of sensors we can use like for heart rate you know collecting that continuously over time integrating that into a model and then you know making predictions or monitoring someone's health in that way so you know we know that like you know things in health are cumulative it's not just about the state when you're at the doctor's office. It's about like your state throughout the day and, you know, throughout the month or year. Um, so that, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of application there. Bruce then said, Apple iPhone has light, uh, the LiDAR scan in it. Yeah. So you can do this in your iPhone. You have this technology in your, your consumer products. So it's not like this is high end stuff that only, you know, large corporations can do you you have pretty decent resolution stuff like yeah. lidar and other things motion capture although the way that they do it for like a human model is you know mocap actually used to be much more complicated than it is now because it used to be like you'd have to set up this room and you'd have to have these cameras everywhere and you'd have to put on a suit now you can do this actually uh the MetaQuest headset will track your hands if you have enough light in the room uh, just mm -hmm. through the headset uh, sensors. So, you know, these are things that they're working on that, to make them much simpler. Um, and so, yeah. And then Jesse said, yeah, I had to use LiDAR for Canvas 3D scans for a project. I'd be curious about modeling vitals and biometric data. Yeah, those are other things I'm looking into. Um, yeah. There's a lot I could say there. Um, we can go back to the other comment too. I don't know. Like, if you want to, I want to finish the, the the volume, the discussion about the digital twins and stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> did we have anything else to say about that? Or, we, I mean, we had a bunch of comments, but we didn't. Okay. Um, that's definitely, I, those are, those, I, I, I've taken some notes on one of the, the whiteboards and I want to follow up on some of those things. I think, yeah, I think some, some major things I'm taking away from all of this um, meetings is there's sort of the, the disability chronic illness neurodiversity track that's emerging a bit. There's the metacognitive developmental stuff, which I feel like I don't really know, like it's soup to me, to me, there's sort of, I don't know what to call that. Um, but that it, like, it goes all the way up to like a lot of dev AI stuff and to even diva worms of embryogenesis kind of things. Like there's, 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 there's something there that I want to call, that I want to identify as something. I don't know what that is. Um, and then I'm really glad to have this discussion about the holograms and, and this, this AR talk, I think is great because Rochelle is here. Um, related to maybe some like very future things for that, but for my own self too, like there's a lot of stuff in that space that I be interesting, and then also the literacy of correlates stuff. I think literacy of correlates might actually become a paper I try to put out in in the methods project because I think I think there's something there, even if it's sort of a position paper. I think the more that I'm thinking about it, the more I see like yeah, there's there's something I want to do with that. Um, so that's kind of my 
broad recap and then i guess i'll go back to the comment about incentives i put in the chat and basically it's um part of what i'm interested in doing part of how i structured a bit of the frontier map like preprint and like how i'm trying to describe it is i i'm sort of trying to implicitly incentivize certain like contextual awarenesses in in doing that um and it's it, at the stage that it's at right now it's it's not it's more of a gesture not not gesture but more, like more of a it, it's it's not like I, I don't know if it comes like oh I've, I've ingrained incentives in this project to increase the metacognitive capacity of trajectories of development of ideas across time like i, I don't think i can say that but but it's definitely something that's in there and part of what's really interesting is that why the why the, the hyper digital design conference that Jenny's put together is, is interesting is that I feel like it's a space where this is very, um, e what they're looking at there at a philo philo philosophical level and also sort of the mesh point of ideas and, and technology is really interesting that way. Um, and I, I specifically said, uh, I forgot, I keep forgetting the person's name, uh, the medium is the message, but also- McLuhan. I think, yeah. Is that? McLuhan. I think McLuhan himself also said the medium as the massage too. Like it was both. Yeah. And the massage part means the kind of, not coercion, but sort of the, the kind of conditioning aspect that comes through using the medium or the, the technology or the, the means of communication itself. There's sort of a training or a condition that's happening through using it too. And I think that's all very relevant too. Like the way if if, if you make and it kind of goes back to the play talk about are you are you incentivizing quote unquote play that is really just up, like singular singular single singular like monolithic reward system which massages a specific way of approaching affordances and maybe dismissing oh well i know it's got to be this way so i want to dismiss anything that doesn't get me to that in a very like pruning of a possibility sense or are you incentivizing things in a way that's massaging or conditioning uh you know different different things that are different than that and i don't want to say just more options is better but just the, the the way the user is um, rewarded or or not rewarded in in, in the education and training and the playing um, is is all related to that. So I will leave it at that for today. All right. Well, no, that's great. I think there are a lot of interesting things there. Um, I, I never thought about the medium as the massage too much, but. It is definitely a conditioning aspect to it. So, like, you grow up in, um, you know, a certain media environment. Like, people grow up with, you know, uh, three networks and a television with six channels or less. And you have a different view uh, on the world than if you have, like, you know, a lot of channels or even the internet or even VR. So, you know, we haven't really had a generation that grew up in VR yet. Uh, I know, would that be different than, like, generation who grew up with television or without television? This this is actually exactly something I am, I don't, I don't think I can say working on, but I, I'm putting some things together about this specifically. And and sort of, I'm calling it sort of like, a, like temporal impact distortion. Uh, like, I'm working on some things about exactly that, like, uh, in a lot of ways, I think millennials or later millennials and the future generations, there are certain things that culturally at the at the scale, both both like in the terms of development of like you could say society or, or whatever, um, but also technologically, have never been available at the degree they're at in terms of those networks, in terms of those. Um, the diversity and also there's a huge I think there's a huge gap generationally that way too unless unless people have been it's not necessarily generation because some older people are very very in touch with all this stuff 
but just the huge disparities of like signal to noise even like there were there was so much there was lesser signal and lesser options you had to choose there we got your three channels you had the abc nbc whatever or you know or a couple of voices that you heard and now there's there's so much there's so much pressure to like maintain there's pressure to put push like you have to you have to designate something as noise at this point relative to that time and you have to designate i need to have a coherent sense of anything that i'm paying attention to so i have to filter out so much more stuff and that's just that's just an extremely different um conditioning like a way of approaching all sorts of a context and, and information and your your relationship this goes back to <laughs> this goes back to the the thrust of the we robot uh poster on uh you know an, an augmented century how are we relating to these changes because they're they are huge changes and, and i i think i i literally think last thing i'll say about this is i think about this a lot from a standpoint as, as an educator or as someone trying to um it, uh, make coherence, particularly across, a lot of in the frontier map sense across this different zeitgeist. Like it's so important to realize that um, the the way that we have the means we have to uh, deal with these different networks or these different sorts of flows of information is 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 radically different. And I think it's, I think, I don't think we're even really even, I think there's a lot of like blooming critical studies and, and media literacy studies about this, but I, I've actually considered the gap to be much, 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 much greater than um, I've under, I've previously understood it and, and thinking about it from an, how do I educate or communicate uh, significance across these lines has become really um, motivating and powerful, interesting and, and almost like, oh my God, there's there's a whole lot of literacy and like pedagogical rigor that is not here, that needs to be here because otherwise there's no chance. Like you won't, the, unless it's explicit, unless the differences are, are stated as explicitly as possible, uh, a lot of a lot of really critical uh, context will, will not translate. And I think that's something that we're having to deal with in a, in a large way, so. I'll leave it at that. But, yeah, but. definitely. You know, I think that you're right about that. Like, even you see this in, like, the production of science. Like, yeah, you have papers, yeah, exactly. and papers don't communicate things in the same way that, like, a video does. Or, like, uh, well, even when you give a talk, and you put it in PowerPoint, or give a presentation, there are things you pick up on there that you wouldn't pick up by reading the paper, and vice versa. And so then having these different media mediums that you can use to disseminate the information is, I think, key. And we talk about that with respect to artifacts. We say, what's an educate? What's a artifact that we can create? And so that can be a lot of things. Uh, the reason we want to do like multiple, give multiple options, is because sometimes some media are optimal for what we want to do. Like if it's a uh, maybe a review, you might want to write a blog post instead of a full paper uh, because it's maybe more accessible the way you write it. It might actually be more accessible to do a video or maybe a virtual world, depending on what it is. And, you know, there we don't want to think necessarily in terms of, like, richness. It's just different content promoted in different ways. So, like, in a virtual world, we might be able to, you know, promote some types of ideas and concepts. Some other concepts might be better off in a paper or a presentation or whatever. We just have to think about what's optimal. And, you know, and people have these different contexts. So, like, younger people would be more comfortable with a video, maybe, than a paper. Or, you know, if you're not, if you're trained in academia, you do learn to appreciate papers because you have to spend time with them. And then eventually you get, it becomes like this unit for you where you're in, immersed in that medium. And it becomes a lot richer just by having been conditioned into it. So when I present papers, people think, wow, that's a lot of stuff. But if you're really conditioned to, to appreciate what's in a paper or the structure, you get more out of it just simply because you've seen more of them. So that's why I like to do that. Um, 
and you know, it's it's. Uh, I don't know if it's any less rich than a video if you really know the area and you appreciate papers. So I mean, you know, there are a lot of things to explore there. I think. Yeah. One one final thing I'm going to say, mostly for myself, but to come back later. I think a contemporary Norbert Weiner would say something along the lines of the generations were right now we're on the cusp of as a user the the generation like the, the current generations and younger are going to have something that's never happened before on the planet in terms of technology easily you said like making a digital world yeah you said it kind of casually and i think that's i think that's remarkably there's so much in that because yeah you can now create a digital world and an embodiment that offers even even at a kind of superficial level the ease of generating that going into that space and realizing that it's sort of like um it reminds me a little bit of what amanda was saying earlier in the neurodivergent talk like this week about are are we are we seeing something as here's the monolithic view of this versus what's the wiggle room on the margins, and so this, I I think it's huge. I think a modern day Norbert Weiner savvy to all this stuff would indicate, not only is it, uh, like across timelines, like there's an embod like the ability to, for a user to experience, not just different embodiments, but but like, the different like the modalities and the fluctuation and the variation and the fact that there's so much more agency and choice in those spaces, I think is um, a big, a big thing ahead. I think there's a lot of frankly political and, and, and techno political and uh, what's the word, uh, uh, techno societal imaginaries kind of things. Like, all, like there's a lot in that space that, that is affecting, um, a lot of a lot of how things have been conceptualized for a long time, and I will, I will conclude on that note. But but there's a lot of fun things to talk about in this space and have them considering it very much. So yeah, there's a lot of good stuff today. Oh, absolutely! Thank you. Yeah, so like when I say creative uh, virtual world, I don't mean to be like casual about it, but it's just like in the interests of unpacking all that. Um, oh no! But I, yeah, I meant, I meant casual <laughs> as in like. That it doesn't blow your mind immediately, and you can't. No, honestly. like, like that's actually something that it, it's not easy to. It's not trivial, right, right? But like, like I don't think that was really, if that, like, if that came up even like I don't know 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was like, oh yeah, like there was thought about it, but now it's like, you know, you can go, you can, as a, as a, I, I could make a virtual world, and everybody too, I could make a Discord server, which is almost like an easier version of that, you know, yeah. if I made. With these other models you're talking about, et cetera. Anyway, you get it, you get it. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, any other comments before we leave for the day, for the week? Yeah, I, I had some other papers. I won't talk about them this week. I'll put them next week. And so that's all we have for today. I think it was a pretty good meeting. We had some pretty good themes to follow up on. So, um, yeah, please share all the, the digital twin related stuff. In yeah, class, yeah, I mean, we can, a lot of I didn't capture there. Yeah, and we, I think you know, we can build on this. If people have re re resources or references that they know of, we please add them to our pot because I mean, yeah, I kind of go over these it topics in virtual worlds. I'm doing this par partially for our the benefit of our GSOC project and then partially for this roadmap that we're making, and then just kind of like these issues are really interesting from a tech perspective. So, you know, it's like, it's it's, it's always good to learn more, and there's always new stuff coming up. Uh, so, okay. Uh, thanks for meeting. Have a good week. Right. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Good stuff. Take care. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.